you go, boys. Get you in this trailer. Dung beetles and worms. This is a good sign. Once they get hit on the wet nose from these cans, they back off. G'day folks, Jason and Nick here from the Outer Farm. We're actually on the Outer Farm property this morning. What we're gonna be doing is we've got our two bulls locked up in the compound here. We've got the trailer and we're gonna take them in town and we're gonna winter them in there and keep them separate from these heifers. We're gonna put our bulls to our heifers in spring. That way we get them all on the same cycle within that 42 day cycle, within two cycles. I'm hoping to get them bred back like we said that 42 day period, which gives all our heifers a chance to come into cycle at least twice. So we'll load these bulls on, I think, and take them in. What you doing, big boy? Eh? What you doing, Robert the Bruce? What you doing, ribs? Ready to go on this trailer, boys? We've got them safely here in one piece to the trial property. Nick's just filling up their water. They're going to spend the day in here. There's only the two of them, so there's more than enough forage through here. Look how thick that is. Like I like I mentioned, it was never like this. When we first started, it was like three or four inches high, continual graze. They're the two bulls down there. Where they come from, in the other farm out there, was getting rather sparse. Definitely like, like this. The reason why this is like this, we give it that 42 days, anywhere between 35 to 42 days full recovery before we bring them back in. But this is the second winter pass we've had on this property. This is what well, would have been 45 days on this. Because it's winter, it's dormant, so it's not growing as fast. So we're happy to accept lower forage, as in height, but what we want to try and do, a lot of this pasture here is two foot high. If I've got this left over in spring and those rains come, it's going to be three or four foot high in one of the seeds. So the idea of the winter pasturing is leaving enough there to graze them through twice and get them down just below that foot height and get carbon laid down on the ground. That way when it does rain, all the spring flush will come up and raise in height. A few months back, I've done that video in regards to I've killed or destroyed. 70% of my soil biology. Dung beetles and worms. This is a good sign. There's mud there. I know my numbers are reduced since I had to do the chemical treatment for the ticks, but when you're in a tick zone, you've got no choice. But that's a good sign. We've still got dung beetles and worm castings in the manure. Still 70% down like it used to be, but we had no choice like I mentioned. The tick numbers were horrendous on the cattle and they were losing weight due to it. One more job we've got to do. Nick loves this job. She, she's setting up now to clean the done out of the trailer. My favourite job in the world. She loves it. No, that's why I always give it to her because I know how much she really likes it. It's going to be interesting tomorrow. We had that kill in this paddock. Would have been six to eight weeks ago now. That area there is where we actually done the kill. And what we found, initially we used to just, when we do the kill and they're doing the bleed out, we wouldn't do anything with the ground at all. And we used to have bulls come along and smell that on the other side of this fence, which is, that would be easily five meters. So that's about, oh, it's at about 15 foot. And they would stand at the fence and start slashing the ground with their feet and they'd start foaming from the mouth from the smell of blood. What we found now is if you get to the rumen, which is the big, biggest stomach of the animal, and you cut that open, because all the contents, because ours are just purely grass fed, there's no grain in there, it's only decaying grass breaking down. We cut that rumen open, empty the grass out on the ground and put it over the area of the blood site, and we find the smell of that decaying grass overcomes 
just the, the smell of the blood and give it a bit of time. Like this has been eight weeks, so we're gonna trial it tomorrow when I sell graze the bull out here. It's their first, it's his, it's Robert the Bruce's first sell graze. Ribs, the other bull, the Bazaday has been sell grazed before. We just wanna train Robert the Bruce for when we take him back out the other farm and start sell grazing it there. So it'd be interesting. This is at eight weeks. I know beforehand it was three months later it was something like 12 to 16 weeks and that bull was still smelling it out the fence. I know we've had success on 12 weeks, so it'll be interesting tomorrow when he walks over that area, whether he smells that. And if he does, I'm just gonna have to move him back in and fence this area off. So on the trial property here, we normally have eight headed cattle and we normally takes us 14 days. So with the two head, predominantly it's four times the amount. So I reckon we potentially, even though it is diminished down a little bit because it's the second winter grass, I reckon we've still got up to around that 35 days of grazing left. Um, excuse me. Oh. Yeah, Dar. Finish chatting yet so you can come and actually do some work. Well, well, excuse I, me, I, I can hear you. So maybe wet you. I better stop, guys. The cook's spoken, and uh, I probably should give her a hand. Looks like the bulls are settling in nicely. They're behind me there in the yards. What I want to do now this afternoon is get prepared and set up this cell to bring him into. Our Bazaday bully calf has been in cells his whole life so he's all right with the poly braid. When it comes to the Australian pole, red pole, he hasn't been cell grazed but apparently when he was just before 12 months old he broke through the wire and got to the heifers. So apparently, supposedly they'd set up tape, so he has been behind tape before. Tape is a lot thicker than poly braid. I'd say it'd have to be, well, I think tape's roughly about that 10 mil, 12 mil, half inch wide. Whereas poly braid, it'd only be, I well, wouldn't even be a quarter of an inch. So it's harder to see. So what I want to do is, what I like to do with all my cattle be, to cell graze them or to train them to hot wire, because it's hard to see. I'll bring out my old trusty cans. Obviously you can see most of them are beer cans because Nick's, Nick's a bit partial to a beer or two on a hot day. Well, beer or two on a cold day for that for that matter. It's winter time and she's drinking at the moment, I think. I hope she can't hear me. So what I like to do is when I set my poly braid up, I like to put shiny aluminium cans on and that gets the attention of any cattle that are in there. Half the time, well not even half, three quarters of the livestock go up and they sniff the shiny cans because they're glittering in the sun. Once they get hit on the wet nose from these cans, they back off. I've had cows in the yard for two hours just standing at the gate looking at this poly braid and these cans for two hours before they go out again. So it definitely works and it's a lot easier to see than just the poly braid on its own. So nice shiny cans. I'm going to put about eight on mine. Also, with my step-ins, for the area we're going to set up, I generally only have, because this is a narrow end, I generally only have three step-ins with my cows because they're used to the poly braid and it's only just to keep the poly braid in the air. But because this bully calf is not used to poly braids, I like to double the amount of step-ins in my training paddock for the first few days. So what that allows to do is because you've got them a lot closer together, the visibility on these posts are easy for the for the when you're training cattle to see. Instead of a wire, which is especially this height now, is going to mix amongst the grass, it's harder to see. The posts stand out. With the glistening of these cans, can't be missed. So I'll set that up and then we'll set the paddock. What I'd like to do is I just obviously undo the handle on your poly braid or your reel, and then to shred those cans on. I'll get them shredded on. So there's an aluminium tab there. There, there we find that they hold on quite suffice. Just shred them through the loops. Shred them down the line. Obviously we aren't partial to what beer we drink. We've got Bolter here, I don't mind that drop. Great Northern, 4X Gold is a go-to for mine and the Coles. Got to have Coke to mix with your rum if you're a Queenslander. And you don't drink rum, well, I don't think you can really call yourself a Queenslander, to tell you the truth. 
Canadian club, that's always good when you're a bit bloated on beer. It's a light drink. It's a cross between a spirit and a beer, I reckon. Pretty easy to consume. Ginger beer. That's, a, that, that's on a good night when you want neither beer or spirits. And back to Canadian Club. So any of these beer companies on here, soft drink companies that I mentioned, if you want to sponsor me, and, and I'll only use your cans when it comes to making my training paddocks. That way you guys can get some good publicity. Hint, hint. Out of farm Queensland at gmail.com and we can talk. To well, having said that, if you're a beer company out there and you've got, I haven't mentioned one of your beers and you'd like to be mentioned, I don't mind Coors, Canadian beers, I don't mind anything actually. I'm open, I'm open for any choices or suggestions. Right, hey, we'll go run them out. When it comes to cell sizes, like I mentioned this morning, we normally run between four to six head of cattle here doing high stocking density when we're going through our cells. Because we only got two, obviously we don't need the large area. And those four to six animals are normally in the cell for 12 hours. So what I plan doing here, because I've only got a third of the animals, I'm just gonna use half the paddock or maybe a tad bit more of the paddock, say a third, and go for 24 hours. You don't really want to be putting them in the same size paddock as where you would have six head of cattle for 12 hours because that means you would have to leave them there for anywhere between a day and a half and two days. What that has a tendency to do is this winter pasture, a lot of it's come to seed, which means it's, it's draining an energy. They will selectively graze around that and eat the palatable stuff which hasn't seeded first and then you left that stuff standing. So if you put them in a smaller area like we have here you're forcing competition between the two the less animals the smaller area the smaller area the more competition then they've got a tendency to eat those less palatable pastures and not selectively graze around if there's a competition with another cow not only are you reducing the amount of selecting grazing you're doing by smutting in a smaller paddock for the competition instead of having them in there for that two and a half days or three days if you only got in there for 24 hours in a smaller paddock, you've got the competition, you've got armor lay down because a lot of these weeds, these seeds, when they walk around, they're laying them down too. You're getting more pressure on a smaller area, but the main thing I like about it is the feces. If you've got them in the same area for three days, walking back and forwards over their feces, that's not healthy, especially if the flies, it's not that flies are an issue this time of the year. The flies are laying in the feces, is that they're going to hatch if they're constantly going back and forwards in a large area the, you're trying to move away before they the flies hatch the longer you got them in an area the less movement you got away down the track so three or four days down the track they could be far enough away if they were had a small cells they would be far enough away when the flies start to hatch So we've got enough polybraid out there. Just loop him up three times, then off. The only thing is, the old boy put these up before I even learn about timeless posts, and that's steel post. The only issue we hear is you either got to sit it there and hope the cows, hope it doesn't slide down that line, or on the other side and put it there and hope it doesn't slide down there. It's not too much this side; it's when it slides the other way. But with the teeth. T posts I use at the moment of timeless, they're great because they are the, they are the insulator. You do without a way with these insulators and thread it straight through the post because it's PVC. And you've got no issues with the handle sliding then because it's a matter of just placing that handle on and locking it against the T post. So you use the T post between your between your spool to lock it in place. But you can't do that here because that's steel and it's touching the poly braid and it'll earth out and your electric fence will be no good. So it's either one or the other. I'll rest it there, generally, and I get enough support on it back there and tighten it up that that metal handle doesn't come in contact with that steel. We'll go set the uh, O'Brien step-ins up now. Get one can there. 
screws in there. So when I set up my gates, I like to set the gate up first. Reason being is you can take that slack wire up now of that line you put out to make that nice and taut. It's a matter of just putting that in now. So what that allows me to do, I've shown it on numerous videos before. The way I like to set my gate up and turn it with the slack line there is when I take my handle off here now that line where those cans are on your end is will be tight once i put these other step ins in that'll be off the ground and that allows me to make a gateway here and when i call my animals through they come through around me and i always like to look and check them for conditioning as they go through here so i'm forcing all my cattle to come through me so i can do a visual inspection on them rather than wind the whole line up and have them all go across that way if you've got any cattle with any issues you can individualize those cattle when they come through and take their number or take note which cattle they are and you can treat them accordingly and not just having the masses go through when you can't do a visual inspection on every single one so that one's set we'll slide these cans down and we'll set these up like remember i'm using double the amount of posts that i generally would because i've got one cow in here that i'm not sure is trained been on tape but not poly braids. We want to make sure that he's hot wire trained through his whole paddock. Oh that's beautiful. Sunset perfect for this demonstration. I've set that poly braid up. You can see my nice shiny glimmering cans between each step in post. Oh, they look that good. I could go up and lick them myself. So that'll definitely work for the new bull. He'll go along now once I energize that. And he won't be he won't resist himself giving those cans a lick and get a bit of a zap. So like I mentioned, this is half the size what I'd normally give four to six animals. So this is gonna be a 24 hour graze. Currently they've been in here now since about midday, and it's probably five o'clock over here. So that would be five hours in these yards. We'll go in and have a quick look. I'm actually facing that the wrong way. I must apologize for that sun, guys. So when you do a pasture walk, you want to be looking at the grass. I can see that there's flat spots on here. So I know a lot of this stuff, they've already come through and taken a mouthful off. There's even litter bank. Lay down, adding your thatch lay already. When we come through here, that's short, that's only cooch. When we come for a walk through here, see a lot of this stuff here, all flat on the ends, carbon laying down, adding that thatch layer. And that's why this is so thick in here now of cell grazing. All this stuff here, because all this stuff is woody and a lot higher, and they're not eating it, that's what I talk about selectively grazing. They're leaving the seeded stuff, that's a lot higher and woody, and have a look what they're doing out here. All this palatable stuff they're coming back and they got a chance what they're trying to do is come back and take a second or third mouthful so what they're generally doing is overgrazing and that's exactly what you're trying to avoid in the paddocks not enough livestock to do high density grazing in a bigger area and they could go around and selectively graze they're going to come back and overgraze the palatable pasture and leave the tall standing woody stuff at the end so you're left with the woody stuff and overgrazed pasture which is going to take a lot longer to recover because they're eating a lot more than one third of that plant but this isn't the case here they've only been here five hours i'm just giving you an example of the have eaten more of that than the woody pasture left standing but have a look what they've done have a look at the carbon they've laid down so i'm quite happy with that having a walk through here that's got a good graze height And this is that tall woody stuff. But they've definitely come through here. You can see all this stuff's been laid down in between. So they're probably at the point where they can nearly be moved out. We'll just keep an eye on them for a few minutes. One of them's bound to hit it. 
either two things are going to happen. I noticed Robert the Bruce, the red Australian pole at the back, went up close to those cans but never actually touched it. They didn't move. So either he's been, like I said, he's been behind tape before. So he might be well and truly aware that that's hot. This young fella in front of us, Ribs, our Bazaday, he's definitely not going near it. Because he's been in hot wire train since birth. So if it doesn't happen in the next five minutes, it means, yes, Robert the Bruce, that tape experience he has, he's well and truly been adjusted or had a boot from Polybraid. I'm interested now in what happens when Robert the Bruce comes a bit closer. Like I mentioned, that's where we had that kill, right down there, that dark area, where we opened up the rumen, which is the biggest stomach of, the, of a livestock, and we pulled out that grass and covered that blood area. If he doesn't smell that, and that's proof from what I was saying before, here we go. Looks like our Bazaday is going to go there first. That's proof that that has covered the smell of that blood. Because before we were exposing that blood and weren't covering it with any grass or the stomach lining of the rumen. Whoops, sorry guys, which is fermented grass. They were smelling it up to three months and the bulls were going ballistic foaming from the mouth like I said kicking front feet throwing dust in the air but that little Bazaday bull did not even smell that we'll just see what Robert the Bruce does but just have a look at that pasture quality there they're standing still eating in one spot and this is what cell grazing is all about on the other farm where we're not cell grazing at the moment they'd be walking there they're walking mouthful walking mouthful walking mouthful because it's been continually grazed and overgrazed. This has had a complete full recovery. Even it's winter time, this is probably foot and a half. Some of it's two foot high that, and three foot high, that woody stuff. Because it's only been grazed once with one mouthful of winter past, there's still heaps of winter pasture left. What I might do is go and do a quick pasture walk now. That way in the morning we can come out and you can see what it's like now, what they've grazed overnight and how much they've laid down. See all this stuff here? That'd be two foot high. So there's heaps of palatable pasture in here. Like I said, he's already cleaned off that area there. Look how flat that is. They're all woody standing pastures, but all this stuff in between is palatable. Robert the Bruce is over here he's nibbling even though that's all woody it's still got fresh leaf on that woody pasture so he'll nibble all those off and leave the stem because it's really hard harder to digest like i said it's going to take the rumen twice as long to digest that woody stem than it does green leaves which are higher in moisture higher in sugar higher in energy so he's already come through here so you can see all that there's had a mouthful got flat tips on the end of all that grass no water in there mate it's back in the other in the yards buddy so a lot of this woody stuff here like I mentioned all these leaves will get chewed off and they'll leave the stem there's no way this is going to be left here in the morning that's going to be chewed back to stem. A lot of all this is going to be trampled down. So on that note, I think I might leave them here and we'll come back in the morning. It's 8 o'clock the next morning now. We'll jump in and have a look at what they've grazed. Obviously the fence line is still up, so I'm saying that Robert the Bruce, the red pole there right in front of you, is hot wire trained. Because he was behind that tape for quite some time on the original property where he was bred. So I don't think I need to continue on with the cans. But we'll have a look at this graze now. All the way through here, I'm seeing it's all been chewed off. And what we used to call weeds or forbs has also been chewed. All these weeds we used to 
try and dig out of our property become beneficial. The broader the leaf, the more carbon and sunlight it's capturing. Also, Got a fair bit of manure deposited over here, so that's adding that fertility back. All this woody pasture, like I mentioned last night, they've come through and you can see they've eaten all the green growth off that woody pasture. And around it, they've obviously eaten a lot more. So they will selectively graze, like I said. I wouldn't want to keep them in here any longer, even though people are thinking that this is a waste. Look in there, it's woody. That is all stem in there. They've eaten the leaf matter off. That's where it's all flat on top. But around it, if you leave them in here, they're going to overgraze everything else. So those woody pastures, because we've only got two in here, the moment you go high stocking density, that'll get trampled down. The cattle will be walking through that, trampling it down come summer. And that's when I increase my stocking density, lay that woody pasture down. Every three years I'll come through and do a sabbatical and get it mowed. But it's not every year. There's a fair bit of manure. That one there is perfect ponding. The one over there is really high. And that doesn't surprise me because where they've come from, they haven't got the green forage like this out in the other farm. A lot of it's partially dead or dying because it's all come to seed. So they're getting a lot more woody pasture and the rumens obviously it's got higher in fibre and the rumen's struggling to digest it and it hasn't got the moisture content as though perfect ponding. And that's when you know your cattle are in the internal health of the cattle. If you get that ponding and it's about an inch and a half off the ground, the manure, the rumen's working effectively. When they start to stack up high with no ponding, then you know the rumen is not in a good state. Come through here, this is where they first started off. Hello ribs, how you going buddy? So this here doesn't look like they've grazed too much more overnight, but like I said, that's about six inches there. That's that woody pasture. No, I'm happy in here. There's nothing in here. I'm gonna move them out into an area. We're gonna do 24 hour grazes. Rather than the 12 hours and make it too small, I don't wanna narrow up the area. Because then it makes, especially if we're not sure about the bull, we don't want to cramp him in into a tight area. At least the bigger area of a 24 hour grazes instead of 12 hours is going to give you more area to move. Rightio, come on boys, come on boys, come on boys. Come on boys. Come on boys. Good 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 boys. have a quick look at the area they'll be grazing today and this afternoon we'll come back and have another look at what they've chewed down. I didn't get a chance to come back yesterday afternoon and show you guys what they grazed in that 12 hour period but this is that area here 
I've pulled down, I've since pulled down the fence and set up a few more cells this morning, but this is that area they grazed. Looking from here, you would think they haven't grazed much at all, but a lot of this, like I said, has come to seed head. But if you have a look down below the foliage and into the leaf matter, all this through here has been chewed off. And that's probably, oh, they have to be about a foot, a foot in height left. I can see all the way through here, it's all been nipped off at the leaf. Some of the leaf, or should I say, some of the seed heads have been chewed off. I reckon there's probably a third to a half seed heads, but the other are remaining. But that'll drop down and thicken up this pasture. Not that it needs thickening. If you come through here, where there was no roads grass, all the way through here, you can have a look. It's evenly cleaned off. I'd say this would be close to six to eight inches through here which I don't mind I normally like to leave that 8 to 12 inches but because we're coming out of well we're in midwinter now so the next month will be August and the end of August September is when we start spring hits so if we get any rain I'd sooner have it now 8 inches 6 8 inches high so then if it does rain and we get that that spring flush I won't be behind the eight ball. It just won't race up and come to seed. It gives me time to get some new green foliage in and to bring the cattle back in from the other farm back into here to chew it off. But the most exciting part for me about the regenerative farming is have a look at the grass they've laid down. This that they've laid down is the future. Is the future soil, the future pasture. The more carbon you get laid, the more moisture you can hold, the better it's going to be for the soil life and the moisture. And all the seeded pasture that now drops the seed amongst that thick foliage, when it rains, you can now push that seed through and form a seed bank for you under the protection of that foliage. And over the years, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. Like I said, on the trial property here, it was continual graze, four inches high. Now we're struggling to keep up with the growth between the two properties. It's growing out there, but then we've got to bring them back into here and graze it in here as well. And not just a couple of head, we need high stocking density in here to keep up with the growth of how thick the forage is, and that's the exciting part of it. That's why I can't wait to get out the other farm and start cell grazing that. We're we'll still setting the system up there, so hopefully in the next couple of months we get it all over the road and then we can put our single hot wire down the side. But anyway, I'm going to get out of farm, do some more fencing. So have a good morning, have a terrific afternoon, and an awesome evening, guys. We've got this from, and we'll catch you later. Just notice that lights are around the other way, so apologies for this ending, it's going to be an echo. Have a good one, guys.